I've entitled the message today, What Do You Think of Me? Now, I don't ask that as a question of you about myself. I'm not asking you what you think of me. I'm asking each of us to reflect on that question about yourself. What do you think of yourself? It's an important question. A teacher once uh, stood before their, her class and wanted to teach a lesson on self-esteem and, and talk about uh, how these kids viewed themselves. And so she asked the students in her class to stand if they believed themselves to be unintelligent. And, and it was part of an illustration, part of a, an object lesson that she was trying to accomplish. And she didn't really expect any of the students to stand. But after a second, a young boy rose out of his seat. Rather perplexed, she asked, why, why did you stand? And the boy said, well, I didn't want you standing up there all by yourself. <laughs> The question before us is, what do you think of yourself? How do you view yourself or others? Uh, you probably heard the saying at some point, you've got to love yourself before you can love other people. And we have been told, probably, to love ourselves and to do it well. We've told, been told to believe in ourselves. The key to being happy is to love yourself. And then we've been told tips on how to do that. You know, you, here's ways you can love yourself better. Perhaps you can, if you lose a little weight, you can love yourself more than you do now. By feeling better about ourselves and a better image, we can boost our self-esteem. One psychologist I read online suggested that to feel better about yourself, you should channel your inner rock star. Now, I don't think they were meaning that literally. It was sort of tongue-in-cheek, but... What it means is you need to tell yourself how awesome you are. Robert Schuller, a relentless advocate of self-esteem, once wrote, Sin is any act or thought that robs myself or another human being of his or her self-esteem. Now I ask, is that the biblical view of sin? Is sin simply that which makes us feel bad about ourselves? Or does the Bible talk about sin in much different terms? Maybe we could also ask the question, is self-esteem even a biblical idea? Well, on one hand, the Bible tells us that mankind naturally loves himself. For instance, in, first, or excuse me, in Ephesians chapter 5, the Bible says there that a husband should love his wife. And it says, for no husband ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it. We naturally love ourselves. But we're not necessarily called to do that. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3 gives a long list of characteristics of those who will be in the last days. And it's a terrible list. But at the top of the list is that those in the last days will be lovers of themselves. That will be characteristic of, of people in the coming age, in the age in which we live. They are lovers of themselves. So how do you view yourself? How do you view others? It's a vitally important question. So much of what we do and how we act and how we treat other people is based upon how we view them. This morning, the passage that we're looking at is going to reveal this truth. We can only be wise... By thinking rightly about ourselves and our world. We can only be wise when we think rightly about ourselves and our world. This passage comes in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And as we have studied these first three chapters of 1 Corinthians, we've learned that the Corinthian church had some vision issues. They saw the world through a skewed lens. And they tended to view themselves and others wrongly. They oftentimes would lift themselves up. They, would, uh, they didn't seem to struggle with a low self-esteem, we'll say it that way. The Corinthians had a very high view of themselves. And, in, and because of that fact, they also had a skewed view of others. We see that even in these first three chapters. The Corinthian church was dividing against itself and following popular leaders. Some were saying, I am of Paul. Others saying, I am of Apollos. Others saying, I belong to Peter. See, they had a wrong view of themselves and a wrong view of others. 
Well, as we study this passage in verses 18 to 23, uh, it's going to challenge us to think rightly about ourselves and about others. And there are two threats that we must avoid. Number one, do not be deceived about yourself. Do not be deceived about yourself. Look in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 18. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. Verse begins here saying, let no one deceive himself. And the topic at hand is yourself. So in other words, don't deceive yourself about yourself. Don't be tricked or fooled into thinking that you're something more than you really are. Now we know that thinking wrongly about ourselves can go one of two directions, right? We can either lift ourselves up and and create an image of ourselves that we are better than we really are, or we can turn to sort of a morbid introspection in which we classify ourselves and and treat ourselves as if we were worthless, have no adequacy of our own, where we are completely and utterly purposeless. Now, the Corinthians seem to struggle in one direction on this. They viewed themselves as God's gift to the human race. They thought of themselves as being wise and understanding and important, powerful. And certainly that is a problem that we see. People will oftentimes trick themselves, fool themselves, deceive themselves into thinking that they are more important than they really are. But of course, as I said, it can go the other way as well, where people will say, you know, nobody loves me. I'm not good at anything. And that's not just low self-esteem. It's actually believing a lie. It's being deceived. Let's look a little closer. Verse 18, it starts off, let no one deceive himself. You notice there that the problem is coming from within. He doesn't say, look out, there's people out there who want to try and trick you and deceive you. No, the problem is within each one of us. We have within us a a desire, a capacity to deceive ourselves, to trick ourselves into thinking wrongly about ourselves. Let no one deceive himself. The problem isn't an outside force, it's within you. In fact, he says that in the next part of the verse. If anyone is among you, there it is. If anyone among you, not from the outside, but in the midst of this church, let no one deceive himself. Some translations render verse 18, stop deceiving yourselves. It's actually a negative imperative here. So in other words, stop doing something that you're already doing. Corinthians, you are... Viewing yourselves wrongly, stop it. Now, how are we deceived? Well, that's the question that's going to be answered for us here in 1 Corinthians. He says, let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise. First of all, we deceive ourselves by appearances. By appearances. You notice at the rest of verse 18, let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you, there it is, among you, seems to be wise. I want to camp on that word seems. It's a word which talks about a person's perspective. Sometimes it's translated think. Sometimes it's translated appear or seem. So if anyone thinks he's wise, if anyone seems to be, if anyone has the appearance of being wise. See, appearances is often how deception happens. Something looks a certain way, and so we start eventually to believing that that actually is the way things are. So if you have a person who seems to be wise, who, uh, could we say, dresses smart or acts smart, well, we tend to think, well, that person must have a, a good education. They must be pretty intelligent. See, we judge on appearances. Uh, let me, let me d- kind of describe how this might happen in a person's life. Uh, Even if something is not true, we start to believe it if it appears to be true. We know, first of all, that we're not really better than anybody else. 
we just sort of accept that. But as we start to look around, we notice that the people around us, you know, they're not, they're not as good as I am. Uh, you know, I, maybe I am a little better than these other people. And we start to cast ourselves in the best possible light imaginable. And we compare our best qualities to other people's worst qualities. And we say, huh, you know, I guess I am better than them. Pretty soon the person becomes elevated and, and starts to believe that which initially they knew not to be true. We deceive ourselves by appearances. And this seems to be the game that the Corinthians were playing. They seemed wise. And undoubtedly, if you had walked into the Corinthian church, you might have thought the same thing. Here's a group of people that seem very uh, intelligent and very uh, on top of things. They're a really sharp group. Paul says, if anyone appears to be wise, there's this appearance. It's like a mirage in the desert. Think of a man traveling across the desert and he has a compass in his hand and the arrow is pointing him towards civilization. But as he goes, he is thirsty, wishing for a drop of water. As he keeps walking, he notices out of the corner of his eye an oasis, trees, water. But he knows it's a mirage. I've got to follow the compass. I've got to get to civilization. There I'll find help. As he keeps walking, he becomes more and more tired. And his tongue is as dry as the desert sand. Suddenly that oasis looks really, really good. And what initially he knew was a mirage, he now thinks, well, what if, what if it's not? What if it's the real thing? And he begins to deceive himself till he turns away and heads after the mirage. Of course, when he arrives there, it vanishes away. And now he's a half day's journey off his path. See, we do the same thing. We judge by appearances. We deceive ourselves into thinking wrongly about ourselves. Such self-deception uh, happens when we seem to be wise. When we accept something based on appearances. But secondly, we deceive ourselves by faulty comparisons. By faulty comparisons. You notice in verse 18... If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age. See, the Corinthians had set up this age and the wisdom of the world as the standard. And then they measured themselves against the standard they had created. The standard of this world. It's a faulty comparison. God says, in fact, he says in the very next verse, the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. God says you're using the wrong standard. You're using the wrong standard and now it's given you a wrong view of yourself. And this is so often what we do. We use the wrong standard. We use faulty comparisons and it gives us a wrong perception of ourselves. We listen to what the world is saying is important. What the world says is great. What the world says is valuable. And then we measure ourselves to see if we, how we stack up. Gives us a wrong view. Here's what God says, though. Verse 18. If anyone seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. If you're a person who is a wrong view of self, the answer is repent. Turn. If you seem to be wise, if, if you're one who is deceived into thinking you're something you're not, he says, Repent, turn, and accept the truth. Be willing, in a sense, to become a fool, is what he says. It's actually very interesting in this verse. You could translate the beginning of it. Let no one fool himself. Instead, become a fool. Become a fool. And, of course, he's not saying uh, make a fool of yourself, but he's saying embrace the message of the cross. The world says it's foolish, but cling to it. How much better... To be a fool in the world's eyes and to receive commendation from God than to receive the adulation of the world and be a fool in God's sight. Let him become a fool. Paul then goes on to back up what he has said here with scripture. He uses two quotes from the Old Testament. And if you've been paying attention, 
as we've looked at 1 Corinthians, he does this with almost every argument he makes. He'll make some statements, and then he'll back it up with a couple of verses. So he does here, and I want to look at them. Uh, verse 19, For the wisdom of the world is foolishness with God, for it is written, He catches the wise in their own craftiness. Paul pulls a quote here from Job, chapter 5. Job 5 is a section in Job where Eliphaz, one of Job's counselors, is basically giving Job a hard time. And, and if you know, remember the story of Job, uh, that's basically all the counselors do throughout the whole book. But at this point, he's actually speaking to, to Job, and he says, Job, and he's basically calling Job a fool, and the Lord's going to catch you, Job. Your craftiness, you're not going to get away with it. Well, isn't it interesting, and I think kind of ironic here that Paul quotes this, because Eliphaz actually illustrates his own little proverb here, doesn't he? Eliphaz was somebody who was wise in his own eyes. He was somebody who, if we can quote verse 18, seemed to be wise according to this age. He was making good sense. But who is it at the end of the book who is rebuked? Well, it's the friends, the counselors. Eliphaz is rebuked. He is, in a sense, caught in the trap. And that is the illustration that's used in verse 19. Catches the wise in their craftiness. Like a, like a hunter who sets a trap for his prey. Here comes the man who thinks he's wise and snap. He's caught in the trap. There's a second verse, though, in verse 20. Paul says again, The Lord knows the thoughts of the wise that they are futile. This is a quote from Psalm 94. The Lord knows the thoughts of the wise. He knows all thoughts, the wise and the fool. But here's the man who thinks he's wise, who seems to be wise according to this age. And the Lord knows his thoughts, and he says, what you think is your wisest, most uh, erudite speculations are futile. They're nothing. As I was reading this verse, it made me think, uh, have you ever had this experience where you're talking with someone? And you start to open your mouth and say something, and they cut you off. And they say, I know what you're about to say, and you're wrong. <laughs> well, how did you know what I was going to say? Uh, maybe, maybe you've even done that to someone. But I, that's how I feel about this verse that God does here. The wise is about to give his speech, and the Lord cuts him off and says, I know what you're going to say, and it's wrong. It's futile. I know your thoughts. I know that what the wise of this world say are, in fact... <clears throat> Foolish. Here's what I want to bring this to, though. A proper view of self. And I use that very specifically. A, a right view of self. See, self-esteem says you need to have a better view of self. The Bible says you need to have a right view of self. So what is the right view? How are we to, to think about ourselves in light of Scripture? Well, it needs to be centered, I think, on the gospel. Because the gospel is both wonderful, joyous, good news, but it is built upon the back of horrible, awful, bad news. And we need to keep both of those in balance if we're going to have a right view of self. The Bible teaches that you and I are sinners, fallen, rebels against God. It's not a pretty picture. It is to deceive ourselves to say, well, I'm not that bad. If you're thinking that, you know, I've done some wrong things, I've sinned, but I'm not as bad as that person or that person. Certainly God wouldn't send me to hell. That is self-deception. It's exactly the wrong view of self. You see, that's putting a faulty standard and saying, well, I'm not as bad as some of these sinners but still a sinner. And God is holy, absolutely holy, will not tolerate sin. See, to get one side of the picture, we need to understand that we are sinners. But on the other hand, we also recognize that the gospel is the good news that Jesus died for sinners. He gave his life, died in the place of those who deserve judgment and wrath. That whoever believes in Christ is set free, is given life. And the person who believes is now 
God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. You see, keeping this gospel focus helps us to go, helps keep us from the two extremes. On one hand, we we should never think of ourselves as, I am awesome, I am great. Well, we must keep in mind that we are also sinners. And as soon as we become prideful, we're setting ourselves up for a fall. So the answer is not to tell ourselves how awesome we are. But on the other hand, we shouldn't fall into this depressive, morbid introspection in which we think of ourselves as worthless. Indeed, in a sense, before salvation, was there anything worthy of salvation in us? No, not at all. But in Christ, we are a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are made new. And so it's a paradox, isn't it? When we think about ourselves, it's a paradox. We are at once saints and also sinners. And we need to keep that before us as a right view. Let us never think that we are now too holy to sin. But nor should we ever think of ourselves too sinful to be loved. We need to have a right view of ourselves. But secondly, the second caution that we must take here is Do not be confused about others. Let me show this to you in the text. Uh, You notice verse 18 starts off with the theme of ourselves. Let no one deceive himself. Verse 21, therefore let no one boast in men. So he talks about a right view of self, and now he's going to talk about a right view of others. Do not boast in men. Do not exalt in them. We've already read in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 31, let him who glories glory in the Lord. If you're going to boast, boast about God and what he has done. Do not glory in men. And by the way, I'll say this. If you have a wrong view of self, you will have a wrong view of others as well. And we suffer the same problem. We can go two directions on this, can't we? We can exalt men as if they were gods, or we can put them down and treat them with contempt and disgust. I've got a perfect illustration given to me just this week. You've all seen it. Turn on your television set and you'll see political ad after political ad, and you see both extremes, right? One ad comes on. My opponent is the scum of the earth. He is a horrible human being. You would not want him as a neighbor. You would never want to put him in Congress. He is a terrible person. The next ad comes on. I'm running for Congress and I'm a wonderful person. I'm perhaps the best person you've ever seen and and you would love me as a neighbor and and you should put me in Congress. And there you go, the two extremes. The the perfect person or the awful rotten sinner. And that tends to be the two, two extremes we can go to. Either elevating people unduly or putting them down wrongly. Let's look at the text, verse 21. Let no one boast in men. That's exactly what the Corinthians were doing. When they set up Paul and Apollos and said, I belong to Paul, I belong to Apollos, they were exalting men. In fact, I would say the entire first four chapters of Corinthians are dealing with this problem in an extended way. Paul has just said earlier in chapter 3, I'm a servant. We're servants and we're working in this field together. We're just servants building God's building. Therefore, don't exalt men. We're just servants like you. Nothing special. Fortunately, the Corinthians had a wrong view of people. They tended to exalt those who should not have been exalted. We need to remember that other people are sinners just like us. To treat them with some kind of godly reverence, and and, and there is a, a sense in which we can treat others with great respect, but to treat them as if they were something special steps beyond the reality of they're just people like us. Call it hero worship or celebrity worship or something like that, where we take somebody that we admire and we put them up on a pedestal above reproach, above 
uh, even the level of other human beings, and we treat them like they're something uh, set apart from the rest of us. Such is a wrong view of man. So why is it wrong to exalt men? Two explanations given here. First of all, all things are yours, Paul says. This gets a little interesting. Verse 22. Actually, it starts in verse 21. Let no one boast in men, for all things are yours. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, Cephas is another name for Peter, or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. This all belongs to you. Remember, the Corinthians have been saying, I belong to Paul. I belong to Apollos. Well, Paul here says, you don't belong to Paul. Paul belongs to you. You have a wrong view of yourselves, and now it's causing a wrong view of other people. The the Corinthians in Christ possessed all things. What does he mean by that? What does it mean to have possession of all things? Well, it means in Christ, they were not subject to these tyrannies, we can call them. They weren't Paul's slave. Paul didn't have ownership over the Corinthians, that they had some special loyalty to him per se, except for the fact that he was an apostle. All things belong to them. You see, in Christ, we have great possessions, amazing possessions. These men, Paul, Apollos, and Cephas, or Peter, were all just servants of the church. They didn't own the Corinthian church. They weren't fighting amongst themselves for who would have the Corinthians. Not at all. They saw themselves as servants of God's people. And then to to make this point even clearer, Paul lists off five elements that all belong to the Corinthians in verse 22. The world, life, death, things present, or things to come, things future. These represent, I think, things that control and dominate people's lives. And he says, in Christ, they don't dominate you, you dominate them. They don't own you, you own them. The world, for instance. We are, in a sense, enslaved in the world, right? Because we are stuck here. You can't do anything about it, really. We're here in the world, and that's just the way it is. We don't have a choice in the matter. Life and death are coupled together. We are enslaved under the fear of death in a sense, right? There's no escaping death. You can't cheat it. You can't work your way out from under it. You can't avoid it. It's going to happen unless Jesus comes first. There's nothing we can do about it. In a sense, it's a tyranny over us. It's something we can't control. And what about things present and things future? The clock. We're all enslaved to the clock. We can't do anything about the future. You can't You can't turn the clock back, except for this morning when you turn it back an hour. But you you can't go back in time. You can't change what's happened in the past, and you certainly don't know what's coming in the future. We are under the clock. Paul here takes all those elements and says, in Christ, they are yours. Death has lost its sting. The future, as frightening as it can be, is secure in Christ. We don't have to sit around worrying about what our future will hold when we close our eyes in death. We know that in Christ we have an inheritance. So our future is secure. Death has lost its sting. And even the world has lost its glitter. We are Christ. We belong to him. We are his possession. And thus, as heirs of all things, these belong to us. We don't have to fear them. We don't have to live in anxiety. We shouldn't be man followers and shouldn't exalt men because all things belong to us. But secondly, you are Christ's. He says this in verse 23. You are Christ's and Christ is God. You are in Christ. Not only do we possess all things, we are a possession of our Lord. Not only do we have great and awesome possessions, we are the possession of a great and awesome Savior. We belong to Christ. Because of that, why should one person be lifted up? Why should a person be treated with some 
measure of awe and, and incredible reverence? Why should Paul be lifted up above Apollos, in other words? We all belong to Christ. We are brothers. We are sisters. Not kings and servants. 1 Corinthians is directing us towards a right view of ourselves and a right view of others. Let me bring this kind of to a conclusion and and tie together some of these loose ends as we think about this. How are we to, to view ourselves? How should we view others in light of what 1 Corinthians teaches? Let me give you just a couple of matters to consider. First of all, hold your self-image against the word of God. Hold your self-image against the word. Don't set yourself up against the standard of the world and what it says. Because if you do, you will have a wrong view of yourself. If you listen to what the world says is admirable, uh, what the world says is desirable, then you'll start pursuing those things which create a wrong image of self. Hold your image, your self-image against the word. Study what it says. Understand yourself through the lens of scripture. And it teaches that, yes, we are sinners. Yes, we make mistakes. But we are also a people redeemed and loved by God. Created in Christ Jesus, put here to serve Him. Let's not forget either one of those sides. Secondly, show respect, respect and restraint for others. Restraint in that we don't we don't worship men, but we also respect them. We don't we don't treat people with contempt or or belittle others. But show a proper, healthy balance here. Not worshiping, but not uh, destroying either. And here's the main idea. The one that I want to draw our attention to. It's not about us or others, but Christ. You see, that's that's why we have a wrong view of self and we have a wrong view of others. is because we've stopped looking at Christ and we've started looking at ourselves and others. And we've started... Comparing and judging by appearances. We've started exalting ourselves, exalting others, or or perhaps putting ourselves down or putting others down. When our attention really should be on Christ. And that's what Paul brings it back to in verse 23. You are Christ's. It's all about him. And we get off of that. We have a warped view of self, a warped view of others. Corinthians... We're really bad about this. Their whole worldview was warped because they had gotten their eyes off of Christ. Well, this morning, we want to put our eyes on Christ. And remember, it's not about me and and my self-image at the end of the day. It's about Christ's image and by God's grace, that image being built into me by God's grace and by his spirit.